Thank you for joining us tonight. Welcome to Speak Up, the television arm of Freemasonry throughout New Zealand. I am Barry Rushton, your host, and we have an agricultural theme for you tonight. My first guest is Anthony Berman. He is the Chief Financial Officer for the highly successful field days at Mystery Creek. And following him is Warwick Roberts. He is the immediate past president of the New Zealand National Field Day Society, which owns and runs that successful yearly event, which has just celebrated its 50-year anniversary. How time flies. And rounding out the show tonight, of course, is our regular contributor, Graham Houston, on the life and times of another famous Freemason. And my first guest this evening is Anthony Berman. Anthony, lovely to see you, mate. You too, Barry. Nice to meet you. Field days, eh? 50th anniversary. Now, I read somewhere 96% of the people who went to the field days said it was either great to excellent. 92% of the people who exhibited there said they'll definitely be back. I mean, you can't be more successful than that, surely? No, no, you can't. Um, it's a very successful event. It has been for many, many years. Um, one of the things you haven't noted there um, is that we also contribute $500 million to the New Zealand economy every year. Mm. Um, we have done. Uh, and for the life of the event, it's been estimated to be about $17 billion, which That's is quite incredible. outstanding. The yearly, the yearly turnover from the show obviously is huge, isn't it? And the money that's spent by the people who actually come into town. Yes, so some businesses, um, they have their entire business um, order books filled in the one event for the four days. Started from an idea, well not an idea, a, a vision of one man called John Kneebone, I think, wasn't it? Correct, that's correct, Barry. Um, John Kneebone was a Nuffield um, Kellogg Scholar and he went over to the UK uh, where he saw a similar kind of exposition um, or, or expo show over there and he decided to come back and he wrote a letter to the editor of the Waikato Times uh, and from there the local business um, members decided to come together and actually put on the first show at the Tarapa Racecourse. I think his, from what I've read anyway, his main intent or purpose was actually to try and unite the town with the country people. Is that correct? Correct, he was. So there was two objectives of the uh, society when it was first brought about was connecting town and country. Um, and that, that's effectively trying to bring the farmers to, to, to town, um, show them what, what is on offer, what new innovations are there, um, give them a bit of education on what's changed in terms of the scientific side of things. Um, and then you know, also bringing sort of internationals across from overseas. Um, and all of this is being done to try and advance agriculture throughout New Zealand and throughout the world. Tell me then, how did the Mystery Creek uh, area develop? What, how did they choose that site or uh, how did that develop? It was actually quite visionary what they did. Um, when they found the site, they looked at it and it was a dairy, dairy farm um, and it wasn't running very well. And what they, they identified back then, they had the first two events at Tarapa. They had no weather events, no rain, nothing during, this, um, during the first two that they held. But they realised that when they were looking for a venue, um, they needed to find something that was really quick draining. So they found this site, uh, this property that it's called Mystery Creek as we know it now, um, and it was uh, Sandy Looms. So when we get heavy rains, the actual site drains very, very quickly. And that was quite visionary for what they were thinking. And they could see how big it was potentially going to grow. Um, so they purchased the site. The, the long story is that they went into the bank. Um, this is a group of guys. A group of guys. So we're not sure whether there was seven or 13 um, because the records weren't kept uh, for a reason I'll, I'll let you know in a minute. But <laughs> they went into the bank and said, we'd like to purchase this property on 100% loan. Um, here's our collateral. And they put a roll of copper wire. Um, the story goes that the copper wire was what they used for the, the communications at the Tarapa Racecourse. So they'd rolled it up, took it to the bank, said this is what we've got as collateral, um, we'd like to buy this farm. Uh, and the bank agreed. Um, so that was ANZ Bank, or the National Bank at the time, it's ANZ now, uh, and they've still been with us um, 50 years later. And so the, the, the seven or 13 uh, members at the time, um, they signed a, a personal guarantee each to the, to the bank to say, look, yes, we'll, we'll support this loan. Um, but none of them have ever told their wives to this day. <laughs> Which is fantastic. So they've formed a society, right, and put it under the society called the New Zealand National Field Day Society. Correct. So they A, own the site and own the actual event itself, correct? Yes, they do. So they own both um, the field days. Uh, they own an event called Equidays as well. Right. Um, and every four years we ho host an event called the Expo, um, which is a big, heavy... Um, vehicle and trucking expo and then we own what's known as the Mystery Creek Event Centre. Now I know the society is a not-for-profit society right and you being the the, um, the chief financial officer you know so and I know that the turnover is good and I know there's generally a profit along the way at the end 
Where does that money go? Every year we take um, the surplus that we generate and we put it back into the event uh, and back into the society and the platform that, that you have. So um, we've got 17 kilometres worth of roads um, to maintain and look after and upgrade. Um, and we've got obviously a 65 hectare um, event platform and then 115 hectares in total of land to maintain and look after. So it does take a lot of effort and a lot of money to maintain that. So most of the money that we generate goes straight back into it. Um, but we also do give money to different community organisations. And I guess, as you said, the, the, every four years you do an expo. Now that must take a bit of cash too, I'm sure, right? Yes, it does. So um, yeah. that, that's about promoting, I guess, the wider um, primary industry. So, you know, outside of uh, what you'd normally consider being, you know, field days, which is sort of dairy focused uh, in many eyes, um, we actually try and extend that out to being more than just, um, you know, that, that small niche. And we try and bring in logging, um, heavy equipment, trucks, diggers, all those kind of big equipment and machinery as well. Staying with that aspect, I mean, the, the, the Mystery Creek Day, I'll call them Mystery Creek Days, that's how they get advertised, is usually in the middle of winter, usually sort of June, isn't it? June, July is when you normally have it? Yes, it is. So it's, um, it's sort of the mid-June, mid um, the sort of the second week. It's the, I believe, second Wednesday of the full week of, of June every year. So if it's weather dependent, why would you pick the middle of the winter, say? I mean, is it just because it's, there's, there's less activity going on the farms in general? June has been chosen because you know Gypsy Day has been typically known as the first of first of June, um, which is when the farmers trade farms and, and move farms, and that okay. was a sort of a historical thing. Um, on top of that, a lot of the farms during this time of the year are dry, um, so the dairy farms aren't actually milking, um, so they have some time down or downtime or time off the farm, so they have the opportunity to go out and look at what's new in innovations, what's new in technology, what's what's new and well, being developed. Well, that makes sense. I've looked over the um, the the 2017 financials. Um, and it, it did really well. Uh, I know that uh, coming up maybe next week or the week after, the 2018 financials will be out, right, under your guidance. Uh, is it looking good? It's looking very good. Um, it is looking very good, Barry. Uh, we, we try our best to try and maintain a profit whilst not being a not-for-profit. Um, we try and make sure that we do have a surplus so that we continue to do the good work that we do for the country. Um, you know, as I said earlier, the society provides over half a billion dollars worth of economic benefit for the country. You've been in this role now, I think, for about three, three and a half years, something like that. Going ahead, and it's the, in this changing world we live in, what challenges do you see that lie ahead for these field days? Just much like Freemasonry, um, Barry, we have challenges with memberships. Um, you know, historically, um, there's been a lot less uh, work time in people's lives, and so now we're finding that it's becoming harder and harder for members to give up their free time to support the society. I mean, you know, we, we don't pay um, all of the people that help get behind it. There's 200 plus volunteers and they do an outstanding job at, at getting the site ready and, and preparing everything and, and helping out during the, the running of the event. So that's one big challenge. Um, as I said, we've got 115 hectares, 65 of that is exhibition space and the rest is car parks. So, wow. Yeah. So you've got to cram them in. Yeah, so we, we, we have car parks and, and they're literally bursting at the seams. Um, so we're now having to ship um, people into the event by buses and we're trying to push that as a, as a new mode of transport, but being farmers and being agricultural people, everyone likes to bring have their own flexibility. Bring their yeah. tractor and everything yeah. But we have been doing really well. <laughs> um, you know, we have been moving a, a lot more people uh, by bus every year. A friend of mine ran a, uh, a, a function here in Auckland that was dependent on a lot of people turning up, of course. And uh, the weekend that he had was, was, was clear, but it was cold. So I guess that's one of your biggest worries when you get close to the field days happening. I guess weather's the biggie. Yeah, weather is our, our, our biggest worry. Um, we have you know, a site that's close to the river, so we get quite a lot of wind um, and a lot of rain during the time of the year. So that's why we've spent a lot of money on, on roading. Um, so you no longer have to bring your gumboots, um, but mm -hmm. we still have trouble. We take up almost all the marquees in New Zealand during the week. Now, speaking about Freemasonry, as you mentioned before, I know that you are a young Freemason. I mean, I think you joined when you were about 26, I believe, yes. something along those lines. You don't look a day over 26 now, but um, so you've been a Freemason for about about uh, six years. Yes. You obviously love it. You joined in Auckland, but you now live back in uh, in Hamilton, I believe, right? And you've joined a lodge down there. It's a Copernicus, isn't it? That's correct, Barry. Um, so I joined out of interest of my great grandfather, um, who was um, a part of Grand Lodge, and that's where the interest um, came from originally. Uh, and since then, I've sort of enjoyed my journey through Freemasonry. And you know, surprisingly, you know, moving from Auckland, uh, where I was working most of my life, back down to Hamilton, um, it was you know once I got into the, the role that I had at the society, um, through you know uh, various connections and people talking uh, in the background, and we realised that that Warwick Roberts, who um, was the president of the society at the time, was actually also a Freemason, who will be on the show straight after you. 
<laughs> but you didn't know him, did you? No, I didn't. I didn't actually know. Um, it much, you know, ha Hamilton is a very small place. Um, you know, much like I was also the personal accountant for the first president of the society, which I still am today, and I didn't realise that at the time either. Far out. Now, the, the, the Grand Master's um, directive uh, when he took office was to speak up for Freemasonry. Everybody has thought that Freemasons are quiet and secretive and don't hush, don't tell anybody anything. What are you seeing down there in Hamilton? What's your lodge doing, do you think, that might be sort of a little bit different than others uh, to actually get, not the message out, there's no real message, but to actually be proud of what Freemasonry is all about? So we're a dining lodge, uh, Barry, but we also um, support quite a lot of uh, musicians in, in the music space. So we have different um, music students that we, we, we put funding through and, and put them through the various programs and overseas trips and things like that. Um, That's fantastic. Well, Anthony, thank you for being a guest and coming all the way up from Hamilton. Um, maybe I might get a couple of tickets to next year's um, Field Days in the Post, perhaps. If you're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you. My second guest this evening is Warwick Roberts. Warwick, it is great to see you, my friend. Lovely to have you. Mate, I'm so glad you've got some grey hair like me because I just don't want all of our viewers to think that Freemasons are all young. You know, we've got, there's a few old us, oldies around like you and I. Absolutely. <laughs> it's great to have you here, mate. Thank you for coming. And also to, to continuing, continuing our agricultural theme, uh, we've talked on our previous guest, as you know, with Anthony about the field days, the National yes. Field Days in Hamilton. You had a long association with them right from the beginning, right to the top of the pinnacle, correct? Tell us about your involvement with the field days. I started with field days as a young farmer. We were called on for the very first event, which was at Tirapa uh, yes. Racecourse. That's 50 years ago. That's 50 years ago. Wow. And um, I can remember distinctly they had a plane crash. It was probably the most outstanding feature of the thing. <laughs> Didn't that run into a loader? It, yes, yeah. it clipped a, it clipped clipped a loader. loader and that yeah, was yeah. it. But, um, you know, no fatalities and it's probably just the most excitement. But um, we were doing fencing in those days, so it was um, our job to put up and help the fences. And I went back in 1999 and um, started as a volunteer. Uh, again and um, sort of worked through my way through. I finished up as chairman of events and then I don't know you sort of and then I finished up as, as um, vice president and president and So you're now the immediate past president aren't you? That's correct. Which is yes. fantastic. So you started when the field days were about 30 years old because they started in 69 the first yes. one. You came back in 99 right? So you must be just so proud of how how, how fantastically successful it is. Oh, it's been a, it's been a, a real, yes, it is, it's unbelievable because, you know, you'd think, oh, something that long would probably have faded by now, but mm. in fact, it's going from strength to strength, which is, yeah. is quite fantastic. 15,000 visitors, I believe, in about 69, and 140,000 plus from 40 different countries yes. today. Well, I mean, that's sensational. It is. It's not the largest event, agricultural event in the world. The largest is probably in Germany where they get about 350, 50,000 or more, but it is the one, only one of its kind in the southern hemisphere of those sort of numbers. Warwick, you talked a bit about when you first were involved as a, a, a young farmer. I know nothing about farming apart from what I observe. You know, when you think back to the days of 1980s, 1990s, a young man, he could save hard and he could buy 80 cows. He could then go and find a farmer who had the land and perhaps who would actually build a shed. So the young share milker, he would actually have the cows, do the work, and the farmer would have the land and have the, prop have the buildings, and they'd go 50-50 as a share milker. Those days are changing, aren't they? Definitely. You know, in those days, probably a big herd was 400 cows. Generally, even that share milker then would still save and accrue enough that in 10 years he might get his own little farm. Yes. Well, you know, we all live in Auckland and these people who are trying to save for a house, you know, the house goes up $1,000 in value. They can't say that each week. And that's sort of what's been happening, isn't it? Yes, it is. The, the land's kept rising. Yep. A lot of farmers only farm for their capital gain. Yep. And whether you like it or not, it is capital gain. Unfortunately, of course, these young farmers are going to have to find far more capital than they ever thought they would have. Exactly. And it's, it has changed. It's changed. Originally, you started as maybe a contract milker. Yep. You might actually milk the herd for the farmer instead of him having to go out every morning and milk himself. And then you'd save enough to buy the herd and then you'd go 50-50. Yep. Then you might sell some of your cows if you got a big enough job and you'd buy a, a piece of land Absolutely. or you'd buy a sheet of a piece of that land and away you go. 
So getting back to the, the field day, the, the one you just had in the middle of the last this year, uh, the 50th, 50th anniversary, it must have been quite a wonderful celebratory time, was it? What were some of the things that, that happened on that day, or on that, on that weekend, I should say? I, I think probably it was the pride that a lot of, and it, you know, field days is all about really exhibitors and those who come to watch it. Mm -hmm. And it was the pride of those exhibitors, some of them having been there the 50 years. That's what I heard. And, and it was just, it was great to see. And we, we had an event prior to that for those early exhibitors. And you couldn't believe the, the excitement for them that night. It was, it was really something. I mean, that's a commitment, isn't it? Yes. I mean, if, if exhibitors to say, we're, we're part of it, we're going to be there, and they have been there. Yes every time. What a wonderful thing. You must have done something special for them. I, oh, I think I think it was, you know, and, and it's, it's special to have them as, as exhibitors because without them, it, of course, it isn't a show. You know, if you look at field days, it's really just a big yeah. um, window of, of agriculture. Quite so, quite so. Yeah. Tell us a little about the time capsule. Now, I know there was something happened about that, right? Yes, we, um, we had a note to say that um, the time capsule was put down in 1980. Five, I think it was when the new pavilion was okay. was erected, and they um, came back uh, and said it'll be opened in 2018 on our 50th anniversary. So, um, <laughs> funnily enough, prior to that, they'd tested to see whether they could get the capsule out. <laughs> <laughs> so they took us all down there, opened this lovely big brass panel, and it's there's this capsule down below. Well, <laughs> they couldn't get the brass panel off. <laughs> Is that, that, was, true? that was quite amusing because they'd put it back the wrong way. When they erected it, and you have a hole and of course it was a certain um, shape or it might have been just fractionally out of round <laughs> and they'd put it back. So they did a pre-test and it worked and then they put it back together and it didn't work. It didn't work. But anyway, eventually they got them out and they bring it, took it up and we had a luncheon and we opened things and it was, it was wonderful. It was some of these things that came out of the capsule like the papers that were written then and um, even one of the exhibitors, um, and he was one of our first um, presidents um, had made some predictions, particularly about his industry, which was the agricultural aviation industry. And um, I think out of the 15 predictions that he made, there was only one that hadn't actually uh, yeah. occurred, and one, that was tar sealing an airstrip on a farm. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it was pretty accurate, and it was, it was actually amazing to think that he had predicted all these things that long ago. Which is fantastic. Yeah. Now you've been, um, uh, you've been in Freemasonry now for, and I, I, I will mention it to the people, you joined when you were 22, yes. I believe, and uh, you, have, uh, you have at least collected your 50 year badge, I know that, and, yes. and a few more. You look great though. You don't look a day over, you don't look a day over 71. You know, oh, that <laughs> sounds good. <laughs> yeah, Thank you. But, but your life in Freemasonry has been great, right? I mean, yes. you've been master of the lodge a number of times. You've done lots of jobs. You've been a district grand master, which is quite a fun time. I'm sure that there are new members in your lodge um, have come in and, and I know they'll look to people like yourself to be a mentor. What's some advice that um, you give to younger Freemasons when they first join? Because they naturally gravitate to someone like yourself. I think participate. Um, be prepared to meet people. Don't um, stand back and say, I'm Bill Brown, how are you, what's your name? You know, because it's when you meet new people, the Freemasonry is, is what it's all about. It's about people. And um, without people, it's, you know, you talk about a lodge, but a lodge is actually people, not, not a building. And um, I think, you know, if, if you talk to young people about, okay, what do you get out of Freemasonry? Well, we all get different things, but if you don't participate, you'll never get anything out of Freemasonry. So. Think back to your times when you first started, you know, was your father, grandfather involved? Were you, was no, there any history? It was actually my great uncles who said to me, oh, I think, you know, if you have the opportunity, you should join. And um, I'm, a, I'm a fourth generation in my own lodge. Um, but, you know, it's, it was who I met. I, I knew all, all of these people in lodge, but I'd met them around the town. There was, yeah, yeah. There was the, there was the um, blacksmith. He was a lovely Scottish guy called Archie McSporran Macmillan. What a great name. <laughs> He was. He was a lovely guy, but I couldn't understand what he said. The words, yeah, <laughs> that's pretty close. <laughs> but um, yeah, they were. They were, and I guess they were the stalwarts of the town originally. And you know, we talked about the the, the um, banker was there, and the doctor was there, and the undertaker was a member, and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nowadays, it's probably not quite as diverse, and I think it's. Probably it's nothing to do with Freemasonry. I think it's our life outside is about the pressures on people to not be able to put 
as much time to Freemasonry as they would like. You know, talking about what you're saying about speaking out, I had a gentleman call me uh, last weekend and said, there's only one gripe I've got about this show, Barry. I said, what's that thinking? Oh, no, he says, you're not wearing a little badge, so I'm wearing a little badge in honour. Oh, now he'll watch this. I can't think of his name. It's from Tauranga. But you know, yeah. there it is. Warwick, thank you very much for being a great guest. Um, yep. I've got a couple of tickets coming my way for next year, I think. Maybe you can get me into the President's <laughs> Dinner or something, eh? I've got to, got to work every angle I possibly All can. Right. <laughs> Thanks for being a great guest. Thank you. Thank you for that. And continuing with our agricultural theme this week, our regular contributor, Graham Houston. Hello, Graham. Hello, Barry. Good to see you again, mate. I believe you've got a famous New Zealander or someone from New Zealand that you're going to talk about today. It's very interesting when you look around New Zealand, we keep uncovering characters and characters with a can-do attitude. And tonight we're talking about one of those characters, Alexander Walker-Reed. Alexander Walker-Reed was a guy that was born in uh, 1853 in Scotland, in Glasgow, and immigrated to New Zealand with his parents. And they arrived in Littleton and started farming in Southbridge there. And then in later years, he set sail for Taranaki. And he en ended up in Opanaki. And then from Opanaki to the newly developing town in central Taranaki of Stratford. Mm. Stratford at that stage was being cleared and farms were being uh, starting to be established and Daring in particular. And being a farmer, he went there and uh, developed his farm from there. But he was a little bit of an entrepreneur and he thought there had to be better ways of doing lots of things. He got involved with the Stratford district itself and at that stage, the Stratford district was deciding what to do about the power or forms of energy in the city or in the town. Should it be gas or should it be electricity? And he and a couple of associates set up a demonstration within the town at a couple of shops to show what electricity looked like and what it would do. The, town, the council was very much divided and so they put it to the vote of the people in the Stratford district and the Stratford district people voted and they voted in favour of going with this new form of energy, electricity. Which meant then that he and associates set about looking for means of generating that electricity and so on a big S bin on the Pātia River they built a wooden dam with a tunnel that led to two turbines which produced the electricity and they formed the Stratford uh, District Electricity uh, Company of which he was a director of for many years and they provided the power into, into Stratford so they had street lighting, electricity and then the shops gradually started to... I think it's the third town in New Zealand, right? It became the third town after Reefton and Wellington to have electricity. Reefton, eh? Yes, a little place like yeah. that. So that's that indicated the sort of far thinking mm. Uh, that, that this guy had. Now, not only did he stop there, in 1906, 1907, he developed steam cars and he built steam cars. He built three steam cars. Uh, he used motors that were imported from uh, America and modified and they became chain driven and little four horsepower cars and they ran on kerosene. And uh, he didn't build any more because he realised then petrol was probably going to be the future, but he sold two of them and kept one for himself. And before registration came in, he adopted the registration plate on his car, SD1, which stood for Stratford District one. Number 1. <laughs> he continued in the farming area because, again, dairy farming and milking cows by hand was a pretty arduous thing. So it could take some of those guys with six or eight cows up to an hour to milk them twice a day. So when your herd started to get up to 60 or 70 cows, that was a lot of work. So he developed a milking machine mm -hmm. and it was one of the first milking machines that that were developed within the country and he got a patent on those and he used a particular type of pulsator and suction cups and uh, he took this milk machine all around the agricultural uh, shows throughout New Zealand and sold a lot of these machines and even sold them into Australia as well and they were the forerunner of perhaps the milking machines up today we have today yeah. so he certainly saved a lot of time for farmers and the farmers thought he was that the, the invention was one of those inventions that had an immediate an immediate practical use and so the it was known as the AWR milking machine he had to overcome the hygiene problem didn't he for that? There was well a, the a hygiene problem the original the original machines that were being built 
there was a difficulty in trying to clean those machines. And so which gave rise to the to the infection that could come out of the, or bacteria that could come out of the milking by improperly cleaned machines. And so his machine overcame a lot of that problem. He set about initially to make things simple. And so that's what he did. And so the milking machine was, was a lasting legacy. He also developed a, one of the first pop-top caravans. And uh, this, <laughs> yes, well before his time in that area. And he was an ardent photographer. And today, many of his photos have been uh, archived in the Pukiariki Museum in New Plymouth. Wow. And there's a wide array of photos. And he took photos of all sorts of things. And there's early photos of Mount Egmont. And strangely enough, it hasn't altered much <laughs> since, since those days. He was, uh, was he the first master of the Stratford Lodge? He became the, a charter member of the Lodge of Stratford, number 75. That lodge chartered in March in 1892. He was a master mason at that stage and having been initiated in the Robert Burns Lodge in Christchurch and he'd done his three degrees there before coming, becoming north. So he was a charter member of that lodge. A grand, he went on to become a grand steward in 1895 and a grand standard bearer in 1906. So he was a very active Freemason. But he was just one of those characters that you never hear about. And it would be surprised that most of the viewers, if you look up Alexander Walker Reed, it'll be a new experience because he's just one of those guys under the radar, but certainly one of those characters with a can-do attitude, an entrepreneurial streak, and certainly very much an inventor and always looking to make things easier. A true New Zealander, right? I very much so. A good choice, Graham. Thank you again, my friend. Thank very nice. Great. See you next week. Well, that's our show for this evening. Thank you for tuning in. If you'd like to know more about Freemasons, please just go to the Freemasons website, which is freemasonsnz.org, or call the telephone number at the bottom of the screen. Look forward to seeing you next week.